Sally Williams is a clinical nutritionist with personal experience of disease in her family and working with her own health issues, Sally was determined to learn about disease prevention and how to support her own physical and mental health. Through this journey, Sally struggled with food anxiety and constant changing dietary habits, leading her to commit to learning deeply about nutrition and disease. Sally completed a Bachelor of Health Science degree in Nutrition and Dietetics, where she discovered her true appreciation for the human body and the power of food education. She has been practicing for over two years and has experience in treating a wide range of conditions, symptoms and diseases. Her passions and expertise are in gastrointestinal health and weight loss. Sally, how are you? I'm going great, Kate. Oh. I'm really glad to be here. I love chatting to you, so I'm just glad to be here. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so happy you're here too because you have an amazing story with your mum and um, you just told me that her sixth anniversary is, of her death is this week as well. So I just want to know more about your mum, more, you know, you seem to have a beautiful relationship with your mum as well. And then talk more about, you know, how she prepared you for her death and then what you did afterwards. So first of all, um, can you tell us about your mum? Oh, yeah, it's uh, really, really beautiful just to have the space to talk about our loved ones and to talk about grief. So thank you for opening up that space. You know, we connected uh, through talking about grief on, you know, through your grief work but we spoke about grief through my work and um yeah it's just really beautiful to be able to have the space to talk about her especially as I said it's a the six year death anniversary this this week which is just you know the time is just crazy um but my mom you know as a person she was just such an incredible beautiful person um in the last few years of her life she became very spiritual and she was a very very wise woman as people would I guess relate to her in that way or or would um see her in that way everyone would come to her with their problems their issues and she would just always seem to have like the right way of looking at it and the right way of helping people which everyone just loved that and she was like so non-judgmental of everyone like she kept company of all different kinds of people and just never had judgment on anyone, um, which is just, you know, it's just something that you don't you don't see very much in the level of like acceptance that she had for all different kinds of people, which was just really incredible. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's it's funny when you look back on someone's life and who they are towards the end of their life. Like she went through a massive journey and she wasn't always, she wasn't always spiritual. She wasn't always down to earth. She wasn't always, you know, she didn't always have all the different perspectives that she had towards the end of her life. And I think dealing with cancer and multiple times kind of facing death really moved her into, into the beautiful light of the person that she was towards the end. Mm. And yeah, I would say that those last few years, we definitely became really, really close. She was like my best friend. Mm -hmm. I think mainly the fact that I was growing up out of teenage, you know, stubborn, horrible teenage years but yeah. she was also growing herself into the spiritual person she was. And then I think when her last bout of cancer came, you know, we were both in somewhat of a way accepting that we might not have much time left together. So that just really, really deepened our bond. Mm, yeah. Yeah. It's really difficult. Like even finding out that she had cancer, like how did she deal with that? And how did you deal with that? I I think I wasn't very equipped at the time. Uh, you know, I'd actually I'd actually grown up with mum having cancer my whole life. So her first bout of cancer, I was two years old. Okay. And, you know, there's pictures of her holding me as like two, three years old, you know, with no hair and like her her beanies and stuff like that. Yeah. So she faced cancer five times from the ages of me being two to nineteen. <gasps> and when we found out the last time that was when I was 19 and I went to the doctors with her and we found out, you know, together and found out it was stage four. And I don't think I fully grasped what that meant, you know, even though I'd kind of 
I think I think there was an aspect of the fact that she'd had cancer her whole life that I my whole life pretty much um, that I just maybe thought she was like invincible to it or you just go through these stages of like no, non-acceptance you know what I mean it it doesn't I didn't know what stage four meant maybe I did but maybe I just didn't really accept it mm. so I um I remember sleeping in her like with I slept in her bed that whole week you know just like me and her and um I'd had this trip planned to Canada that I was going to move overseas to Canada mm. and I'd had it booked I'd had it like somewhat paid for some of the flights the organization of it and then you know she'd kind of said to me like this probably means that you can't go to Canada um we can move into what happened there because I ended up going to Canada about a year later because I just I don't think I fully came to the conclusion that I, I thought she was going to beat it you know after yeah. a year it's one of those things that you look back on as an adult and you just like, that was probably, that was a silly decision. I went to Canada for two and a half months and I came back, you know, when she had to go into surgeries and stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, finding out, you know, that time at that age at 19, it was still, I was still a little bit too young to fully grasp it, but I was old enough to understand, you know, what cancer was and everything compared to, compared to the earlier times. Yeah. 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 But you'd lived with it all your life, really. So, you know, and she'd beaten it your whole life and it would be difficult to understand that, you know, she wouldn't beat this. I think so. I think I'd just known her as, like, getting cancer and defeating it, you know. Yeah. And I, hadn't, I think there's a, a level of, there's a word for it, it's like the opposite of acceptance, but it's like there's a level of, like, disassociation when you love someone so much and they've been given a terminal illness you won't accept death straight away you know mm. you don't you don't it's not a it's not a you get told that you've got two months to live 12 months to live two years to live and you go oh, okay like that's yeah. that's just it my my best friend my mom my dad my partner my you know me I'm just gonna die like we we don't have that acceptance straight away it's not it would be weird if we I guess it'd be I weird know. it's like right? oh okay see you later <laughs> yeah yeah and you know then you yeah. rely on stories where you like you think you know you rely on hope that's all that's all you can have is just like hope and and determination to try and do what you can but there's never that that acceptance straight away and I think the age of being 19 and having to try and come to terms with that is also like a, an aspect as well Mm, and my mum was a fighter you know she she was always like never accepting and always you know what do we do where do we go from here what are the options so I just kind of followed along with her yeah 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 so did she think she was going to beat it like was there a terminal conversation with the doctor or your mum just thought oh well yep going to do this again I she'd never had stage four um right. stage four I think obviously stage four like stage four is like a terminal terminal stage mm. um so she'd never had it that far I think that there was like a lot of fear for her but she was never just going to give up um she was you know raising money to try and go over to she was going to go over to Japan I think it was oh no it was Germany she wanted to fly to Germany to get some new treatment sort of thing um, she was doing all of the diet stuff. She was doing the chemo. She was always determined. And I think up until the, I think up until towards closer to the end, she wasn't having those conversations about, you know, what would happen after, mm -hmm. you know, her funeral conversations and her will conversations and all of that. But then eventually she did, I think she kind of was just trying to be, you know, like trying to accept but then also trying to get organized and everything um which again was just I, I didn't even want to hear it you know there were times where she would bring things up and I was like you yeah, know talk like that like that's not what we do yeah um but there's a part of that year that I I had to grow the fuck up you know I had to really like I remember the first conversation she had when she was like you know we're going to do the will or this is what I want to happen and I was like no we're, we're not talking those things like you're not gonna die mm. but I think it was a couple months later where it was like maybe when I went and came back from Canada and had to realize what was going on I think I had to I had to level up in myself and go okay like it's time to face the music you know what I mean um I struggled a lot because it was just me you know I didn't have mum's family was MIA um they always had been and they didn't really show up for her like even her 50th birthday she had when she had 
um, you know, when she was terminal, she she had her cancer and she had her 50th and her mm. family was in Queensland, no one came. So she invited everyone. Like, so she was very lonely in that aspect of family. Um, my brother didn't really know how to deal with it properly. Mm. So it was just, just me, you know, I kind of had to face music. And um, we did actually have a, my friend and my mum's adopted daughter, she would call her, she lived with us and she was really great and really helpful as well. Mm. Um, so it was really me and her that were, that were there supporting her I had to just grow up and kind of be like okay what what do you need to happen you know let's go do the world let's go do all this um which looking back you know it's it's all a big blur when you're in it you, your brain's just trying to your brain's just trying to comprehend each day you know and mm-hmm. grieve before you've even lost someone really yeah that's right and that's what ha- happens with terminal cancer you know you are grieving well you're grieving the person that she was as well before grieving that she's going to die and then she dies and then the grieving afterwards and it's all separate but piled on top of one another there's so many emotions you know I I did Tony Robbins at the time when I came back from Canada when mum was sick um I did like a bunch of his seminars in all different places, went to Fiji, went to Cairns, all that kind of stuff. But I have this note somewhere in it and we had to write something that was like something horrible that we felt or something horrible that we thought that we'd never would, that was so horrible we wouldn't tell anyone, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Uh, And I have the note and I remember reading it like a few years ago or a few years later or whatever and um, it just wrote like, I'm angry at mum for dying. Mm. Like I'm angry at her. Like Mm -hmm. I obviously never blamed her but I was like I was angry that she wasn't like she couldn't be mum anymore like I was angry that I was just angry at it and Mm. you know I felt that way um I look back now and again it's I don't know if the choice of words like angry at her but it did feel like that we fought a lot in it Mm. um she was my best friend we still had a lot of fights because she started not being able to do what she could do you know what I mean beforehand Mm. she was relying on me she was asking more of me and I couldn't I couldn't understand that. I think I had, I had so much grief and anger at cancer and at sickness and at, at what was happening that like, I just would turn that on her, Mm. uh, you know, in a way that she would ask me to move Mm. a dog bed. And I was like, why would I have to do that? Like just leave it kind of thing. And have those things. So there was, there was so many different emotions that happen at the same time, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And that's totally natural, Sally, that people feel that as mm-hmm. well. Like, And people are really, um, they find it difficult to say it out loud, really, really difficult to say all those horrible things that you're actually thinking that are real, you know, because your life has changed. And also you were so young. That mm-hmm. is just, you know, it's horrible to be that age and you know having to go through what you've been through and then be in Canada as well how Mm. did you do that how yeah I um it's funny like I we went we went about a year and not not much had happened with mum you know she was I think she'd had a little bit of chemo but it was more like the pill chemo um the cancer hadn't spread she kept getting checkups and it hadn't really gone many places and so I just kind of I put Canada on hold when it happened but then something in me was like I was I was fresh 19 fresh traveling Mm. I was fresh into this trying to figure out who I was and I just was like well mum's fine you know she's been fine for a year now nothing's going to change so I decided to go and um yeah within that two months like more things started to happen she was getting lung infusions she had to go for heart surgery like she had a couple of different things then when she said she had to go to heart surgery I was like what am I doing you know I actually realized I when I went to Canada I kept it a secret from everyone that I met there I didn't tell any of my friends um that I made that like my mom was sick Mm. I think I think somewhere in me I felt a lot of um I guess struggle internally with my decision Mm. or maybe I just you know I was running away from it I think I didn't leave her alone at home she had like her adoptive daughter and she was a nurse and there was you know there was I was talking to her every day and all that kind of stuff 
but just obviously the fact that my mum had cancer and I went away to to Canada it was like there was there was a big incongruence in there and I I think I realized when I got back home I was like wow I didn't tell anyone until I was getting on a plane home you know why it was like I, I knew that I was I probably shouldn't have um but yeah it's it was a lot to deal with in that because I ran away and then I dealt with it on my own in a different on the other side of the world mm. Mm. and you know I came back and became the carer then from that point um mm. became mum's carer and I think at that point when I realized that I wanted to be there for her and I had to come home and and you know leave Canada that it was like okay now I'm now I'm doing this now I'm showing up for her mm. you know I think a lot of people from firsthand of what I see that people were very important in mum's life that couldn't show up you know she had a best friend that wouldn't come see her at hospital because he couldn't deal with hospitals you know Mm. and he was very important to her but that really and that really hurt her so and you know things with the family with my brother like I can see that there's so much in moments like that that people just fully don't know how to deal with it like they fully don't know how to show up because they can't they can't for lack of a better term face the music Mm -hmm. and I think when I came back from Canada it it hit me like a ton of bricks that it was like all right it's time to fucking face the music you know what I mean it's time to time to show up so um yeah there's a bit of a process there was a process there there was a process of of running away and then coming back and and knowing that I needed to needed to show up Mm -hmm. yeah so then um, I can't remember what you said about how your mum dealt with, you know, her grief through it. Um, somewhat poorly. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> somewhat with a lot and a lot of strength, like somewhat a lot of strength. Um, she always did. She had so much strength. You know what? There's two different, there's two different versions. There's how she dealt with her emotions. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think how she dealt with her grief and how she dealt with her emotions and uh, her journey into death was very special. She delved into herself spiritually. She was meditating every day. Um, sometimes she would meditate for hours, you know, she would just zone out and, and meditate. She went to classes. She started um, she was journaling. She was doing all of these different things. It was just all about death. And she started kind of moving. I guess it does happen for people that are looking like that are moving in towards death, where they start looking at different religions, they start looking inwards, yeah. um, all that kind of stuff. So she was she was very much doing all of that and taking care, taking care of herself emotionally. Mm-hmm. Um, but when it came to, and I don't blame her, there's there's so much hurt there when it came to the people that didn't show up, that couldn't show up, I should say. Um, she she lashed out a fair bit with some with some pretty horrible messages. I'm pretty sure she like told my brother she was gonna haunt him as a ghost and like all sorts of crazy oh, stuff. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think that at that point when you when you're so hurt, you know, you never know what you're gonna get from someone that's going through that. And I think mm when like when you're when you're the loved one and your loved one is sick and ill it's like you 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 have no idea what you're going to get each day and Mm. what emotions that person is going through and all you can do is try and be your best and show up and so that's what I was trying to do and I feel like I feel like she did a very very good job in in being with me because I was with her mm-hmm. um, but the people that hurt her I think that amplified a lot of pain for her and all the people that, that couldn't show up that she loved that really really amplified and hurt her you know what I mean yeah so there was a lot of lessons I think for everyone involved in that wow gee so um you've you've gone through a lot with your mum did you go on that journey with her of the journaling, the meditation, the faith searching and things like that, or was your path a bit different? I did. Um, I joined her in her spiritual endeavours for, for years. So she started all of this stuff before she uh, before she got diagnosed with the last bout of cancer. She 
was moving into spirituality she did a couple of quantum physics classes and, and spiritual personal development classes and things like that mm -hmm. she just like totally she just blossomed into such a beautiful person from that you know I didn't even see the change at that those years because I was changing quite dramatically through my teenage years as well but now looking back and noticing the person she was when I was say like 13 14 to the person that she was when I was like 17 18 19 um, just two completely different people with the work that she did and I I did join her because she started getting very like deep into the spiritual side of things where it got a little bit woo woo <laughs> and she was yeah. like a little bit of the kooky spiritual vibe which everyone absolutely adored in her you know um, so I, I started joining her we watched a lot of like documentaries uh, on yeah on spirituality on personal development we that was our time together we kind of would watch those things and would talk about them mm. and she would come back from her classes from her personal development classes and she would come into my room and sit and talk to me about it sometimes she would have you know had some sort of um like work or revolutionary thought or like emotion that she's unlocked or a memory that she worked with and she would you know cry on the bed or she would be laughing about it or she would just talk to me about those things so I think her her growth really had an impact on me because it started making me see the different ways I can look at my life or the different ways I can look back at my past and the different ways I can deal with them because she started doing that mm -hmm. we did we connected in that way and I think you know we both bounced off each other a little bit because I really wanted her to experience some more things in life you know with this kind of terminal illness um, I made her come sky, skydiving with me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How did and you do that? <laughs> I just bought tickets and I just said, we're going. <laughs> wow. Oh my yeah. gosh. So that we did that together. Amazing. Yeah. Good. Yeah. It was really good. I think she was a bit scared, obviously just having that diagnosis and then, mm. and then something like that. But mm. um, she did it anyways. We have a video together of that, which is really beautiful. So we were both bouncing off each other, whereas like, you know, I, I would take her out to do some things that I wanted us to do together and she would, you know, we would spend that time together, which is really, really beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So how were you as a 13 and 14 year old with a mum who was diagnosed with cancer? It's, it's a good question. I, I remember when I was 12 I think she had she'd got diagnosed once when I was 12 and the only thing I really remember of it was we we're at her sister's house my auntie's in in Queensland and I remember her hair starting to fall out and she was feeling insecure because she was it was going around all like all around her sister's house and stuff yeah. so she's like we need to shave it and I remember I remember shaving her hair with her and I just thought it was kind of like a fun like thing I think at 12 like I have I have a memory of her telling me in the car and I remember crying about mm. it and I remember her being shocked that I was crying about it she said to me you know she said oh like are you okay like and I was like no this isn't good you know and she's like I didn't think that you would like understand so that was a really intermediate age where you know she didn't even know if I would know how to react kind of thing but uh, I obviously did and then we did the sister's house and we we shaved her hair. But I, I even remember that kind of being lighthearted because I was like, oh, I'm shaving mum's hair. Like, well, you know, you're going to get a whole new look kind of thing. Mm. But I remember her crying when I shaved it as well. So it was a bit of this somber, I still don't fully understand what we're doing or what's going on, but I, I do. Mm. Uh, they're the two memories I have of that time. I don't remember much else. Yeah. Uh, obviously, I think at that age, I never went to the, the chemo sessions with her or anything like that. I did. Um, when I was 19 obviously yeah. uh, but I never I never did any of that I don't think I don't remember so yeah, yeah yeah so was she truthful with you the whole like whenever she got diagnosed did she tell you all through your life yeah my mum was ruthlessly truthful <laughs> right <laughs> for like everyone all the time that was a big thing about her she was just always always going to speak the truth um that's what I guess caused a lot of friction between her and her family she had a really really horrible upbringing a really really horrific past sexual abuse um you know just all sorts of domestic violence from her father and just lots of horrible things mm. um, but she yeah she 
was always wanting to talk about it, wanting to not push it on other people, I guess maybe a little bit with her family. Maybe that's like a bit of a thing there, but um, she was just always truthful about what was going on for her and her past. And I think that she wouldn't have held that back from me, you know, when I was younger in terms of the cancer diagnoses. So she definitely told me when I was 12 and then we went together when I was 19 to, to even get the diagnosis in the first place. Mm -hmm. So yeah, she was a truthful, truthful woman for sure. Right. So when you were at school, did you share that with your teacher and friends around your mum having cancer? I remember when I was in primary school and we had scripture. So maybe she was diagnosed. I know she was diagnosed when I was two. I think there was somewhere in between the two and 12, uh, maybe like an eight or nine or something. Mm. I remember in scripture class, we were having to do like we were praying and the scripture teacher was asking us if there was anything we'd want to pray about. And I remember saying that I would like to pray for my mom because she has cancer. Mm -hmm. So as a class, we made, we, we all prayed together for her. So I think that was, yeah, eight, eight or nine, somewhere, somewhere a little bit later in primary school, maybe five, year five, years five or six yeah. or something. Yeah. Wow. Gee, that was pretty brave of you too to actually say that out loud to the class I think that's a reflection on my mother yep. <laughs> she was, you know what I mean so I think yeah, yeah yeah she was always encouraging us to to speak up to speak our emotions speak our truth that was a big motto of hers was speak your truth yeah so I think that she kind of you know was ingraining that in us for for a long a long time Wow, that's awesome. That's really awesome. But um, also, how did your mum having cancer or did it like give you a pathway in your career? Because I don't even know what you did before you do, you know, your nutrition. <laughs> I was a hospitality worker. So oh, right. I actually, I actually worked with mum. I left school and I got a job that I hated in a um, office office place I worked there for eight months I hated my life and my mum mm. was working at a pub she was a manager at a pub at the time and she just said you know what I'm done with everything you're going through she's like why don't you just come work at the pub until you figure out your next steps mm -hmm. and so I worked with her mum was the the manager and I was the supervisor and we worked together for for like two years maybe more um at this pub just kind of running it you know back to back which was cool and interesting yeah. she was funny you know she was really um with all the spiritual classes that she did she had a lot of um I can't remember what they called it in their class but it was very much like a working on your insecurities being able to just be whoever you are in front of everyone no matter yeah. if you're really, you know so working at the pub she just would walk around cleaning tables and just singing like oh, so no. and I love her but she wasn't she wasn't the best singer <laughs> <laughs> she was never she was never the best singer but she always wanted to be she got singing lessons she did all this stuff oh wow and, um she would just walk around cleaning the pub and just like just singing you know mm -hmm. so loudly and she would do the pokey room and everyone just knew her as singing mary and it was just really beautiful <laughs> Um, so yeah, we, we worked together, uh, for that period of time in hospo and then I did her illness. And I think the, the, the process of watching her like go through cancer her whole life and how she dealt with it was always trying to combat through food. So she was always doing juice cleanses and she was doing the, the Atkins diet and all these diets that were supposed to be like cancer curing diets and everything. And, um, there was a bit of her path and a bit of my path on my own. So we, you know, I, I saw her doing all of that with her nutrition and food and that kind of aspect. And then I also had a period of time where I went vegan. I had a period of time where I was, you know, uh, had an eating disorder and I had lots of different things going on. So merging those two, once she passed and I, I took a big trip to Nepal to grieve and to just have some space. And mm -hmm. in that time I was like, I need to I think faced with death you know after watching mum pass and 
seeing her in the last part of her life analyze everything she was always wanting to find you know her thing she was studying counseling so she could maybe be a counselor and she was trying to figure out what she wanted to do and I was like you know what like I'm at this age now where I've just watched you know I've just watched my mum pass and she was just analyzing her whole life and what she wish she had done or you know what she was grateful for that she did and uh I just need to figure out what I'm going to do with myself you know I need to figure out what what I'm going to what path I'm going to set and with all of that you know deep diving in my mind of of what she's gone through what I was going through uh, I found I found my way to nutrition so I'm now a um like a qualified clinical nutritionist Mm -hmm. so I found my way to this idea of well I, I want to learn about health and I want to learn about disease because I really after watching mum, I was really fearful of disease and I was really wanting to try and, you know, is there anything I can do to to help myself not get cancer or not do, you know, not get a disease? Mm. When I kind of came around to it, I was like, I've always loved cooking, I've loved food. And that all meshed together to find to find my path towards studying in nutrition. Mm. Wow. So I, I did that when I came back from Nepal. I'd found the college I wanted to go to and and went from there. Oh wow. And you're an awesome nutritionist. I can <laughs> attest to that. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. I love your podcast as well. Like the, um, have you, oh, no, it's Heal My Health. I was mm. going to say, you've changed your name since I last saw you as well. Mm. So I was, you're, it was Sally White. Yes, now Sally yes. White. Yeah. And now you're Sally Williams. Yeah. Got married. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. It was a whirlwind, a whirlwind of a three to four years after I lost mum. I think, yeah. you know, there's there's not a lot of conversation, I guess, around grief in general. Like people just don't really bring it up. And it's funny when you bring up someone, like if you're like, oh, mum did this, and you can kind of see people just like go a little bit like, oh, like I don't know what to say here yeah. or do here. As yeah. the years go on, that gets a little bit easier. But I think, um, you know, I think no one really speaks about all of the the excess kind of stuff that happens after you lose someone because Mm. you're not only grieving, but now you have a whole, like it may be different for different people. But for me, it was like, I had a a house, a dog, uh, like all of mum's stuff and like all of these things that I didn't have before that I needed to now like attend to. Uh, So yeah, the three to four years leading out of mum's death and then studying at the same time and all of that starting the business was, um, was definitely a massive massive time and now six years later I can kind of go (laughs) (laughs) and look back on it you know and look back on her with a with a um with a much more beautiful light that isn't shaded by fresh grief Mm, yes yeah and you said that um you know it was difficult to talk about your mum because people go oh you know was that and it gets easier is it easier for you to talk about your mum or easier for people to hear about your mum I think for me personally I think it would be different for everyone else but it was I always wanted to talk about her I think because she was so forefront with everything she shared her whole cancer journey online she was you know we went in a a newspaper article that we had people come over because we're doing a GoFundMe Um, she was very you know she was very out there and very sharing of her story so I was never fearful of sharing like my grief or talking about her. And I wanted to keep her in the forefront of my mind. I think as time goes on, it gets easier for other people to talk Mm. to because when it's fresh, people don't know how to, to just talk normally. People have sympathy written all over their face, which is, it's beautiful, I guess. Obviously that's the, the emotion that people are feeling because you, you have someone in front of you that's grieving and you want to sympathize with them and you want to be careful and you want to be kind. But there's this aspect of isolation mm. as a person who's grieving when everyone that you talk to looks at you with like looks at you with emotion all over their face, you know, or sympathy written all over their face. It makes you feel for me personally, I felt um I felt very I felt very alone because it was like everyone is just putting their sorrows on me. Um mm because they're sorry for me, you know, mm. and that's mm. great. That's great. I, I get it. Mm. Just once that starts to 
pass and people start to you know once the the, the blow of grief kind of I guess is taken away from everyone else it gets a little bit easier in that sense as well it's not so isolating mm. is there anything that you would have liked to have happened differently it's a really good question <laughs> I I'm just having to think about that before I answer mm -hmm. I think I would have like to have like immediately started to work on myself to be better for my mum. I did that through Tony Robbins mm -hmm. and I was, I have all my, my folders from Tony Robbins where I was writing, you know, I want to, I want to stop being so angry at the world. I was always angry. I had a, I had a angry upbringing and I was, I was very angry. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want to, I want to release this anger that I have so I can show up and be kind to my mum while she's sick because I'm not being kind and I want to be. Mm. I think I would have liked to have done that work much sooner than what I did. Mm. Um, you know, there's arguments that we had early on in the piece where I just I just wish they didn't happen and they didn't need to happen. If I, if I was the person that I am now with the growth that I would have had and if I would have just seen her in all of the struggles that it is, like... That it, that it was for her to be sick, for a strong woman who wants to hold her own to not be able to, um, you know, I wish I, I wish I did that work sooner so I could have been better for her sooner. Mm. I know I was at the end. I know I, I know I showed up at the end, but I think that I wish that I spent more time being able to like be kinder because mm. I, I feel that would happen for a lot of people. I feel there would be so many regrets. You know, I know, I know there's people in my family that have so many regrets now and I'm glad that I got to a point where I could alleviate some of the regrets if I didn't fix myself, you know what I yeah, mean? That's right. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. definitely, definitely that aspect. Yeah. Um, yeah, that would be the biggest one. Mm, mm. Yeah. There was something that went through my head when you said that and it's just sort of zoomed out again because oh yeah there's a lot of people that feel that you know that they wish they had there was wishes and you know you wish that you had been better for your mum more into your journey for your mum and then um you know it's like my mind has gone it's so gone Sally <laughs> I feel, you know, there's there's always going to be some regret if you look for it, but I think yeah. I try as much as I can, you know, to remember the things that I did do, you know, that yes. I, I did my best with, um, even in the last, you know, few days where it's like the words that I said and the time that I took to kind of really be there um, mm -hmm. and not just for myself, but be there for her. You know, I dropped everything um, emotionally, like to just make sure that around her was the right conversation, was the right energy. You know, it was like I, I, I look at those things. I'm like, what did I do right? Um, yeah, and try not to focus exactly on on what I could have done better because it's mm -hmm. like I can't really change the past once it is. And I think there's a level of like acceptance. Um, the level of acceptance in that. But I also think that our society doesn't talk about death enough or the process of death or how how intense that week to two weeks or, you know, month or whatever it is when someone's dying from a disease especially. But, like, in general, we don't talk about what that process is like enough yeah. to then be nearly at all ready for it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think that it's really beautiful the work that you're doing in these conversations that you have because hopefully it can just even give someone the tools where they would just be that like that little bit more prepared to show up for someone that they love yeah yeah, yeah. and did like were you with your mum the whole time during those last couple of weeks yes yeah right so, so 
yeah, yeah. With, um, she she took a turn pretty quickly and it was just me and her in the house so I spent probably two or three days um with her and the on uh what are they called the doctors that come to the house like we were set up in oh, the yeah. house um she had the palliative care that's right yeah. um, palliative care would come on and off and it was just me and then her best friend who was also her spiritual teacher came over mm. and I just saw the situation I was in um and she decided to stay and then after a little bit then my dad decided to come and he saw what was going on he didn't really understand um I wasn't I I retreated a lot I think when I look back I wasn't telling anyone the full truth of what was happening in the house mm. I complained to my dad I'm like he's like oh when are we going to catch up and I was like you need to come here because mum's sick and he didn't I never communicated how sick I never communicated what I was going through I was like no you need to come over here if you want to see me mum's sick but he just thought she was just generally you know dealing with cancer she didn't he didn't realize she was like dying yeah um, you know I, I didn't talk to my friends for about a week when it was like turning really south until a point where like one of my friends like called me like three times and I finally answered and broke down and told her everything so I think there was a there was a part of me that really again isolated myself in it and I think that that's probably one of the worst things you can do at that time um mm you know it's just I think the, the best thing you can do is find probably two people that you care and trust the most to talk about like to tell what you're going through and then take any help that you can that you can get any food yeah. any support any you know anything um yeah. because yeah I didn't do that for the first couple of days which was probably not great for me <laughs> yeah that's right yeah and that's the important thing um is asking for help and then taking it when people give it as well. That's a really tough thing to do because you're grieving and sometimes you're not even thinking about food or, you know, even showering or anything at all. So, you know, it's mm -hmm. a thing that, you know, your brain's sort of trying to comprehend that every everything you're going through, everything your mum's going through and what that means in the end as well. So it's really a, a tough time to actually try to verbalise what you're actually needing, not even wanting, just needing. Yeah. So, yeah. And yeah. that's, yeah, that's why I think I want to, like I want to make death and dying, uh, you know, and grieving a normal, natural conversation with everybody so as people can say, can I help you? So mm. hello. Know. Today we have oh, Renee. Oh, Mag what happened? Oh. I opened your YouTube. I was just going to say I listened to the um episode that you did with the there's a man. I was just trying to find his name. Um, oh. but he was talking about the communities that they meet up. You know, once every year or two years or something to talk oh, about. Oh, that's um yeah, that's right. That's Marcus Pierce. Yeah, yeah. He, I think um, that's really beautiful. Yeah, that's right. And that's what I'd really love, you know. Um, that's what I'd love all people to do. And he was talking about how we're such a young country, but we're also multicultural as well. And I think, you know, more of that needs to happen. And, you know, more of talking everything, talking emotions, and then having people around you know what you need. You don't have to even think about it. Mm. uh yeah that's yeah his conversation was brilliant I love it <laughs> yeah it's very beautiful it's beautiful to hear people's stories you know we all we all have like will go through or have gone through death in a different way like mm. losing a loved one whether that's immediately um unexpectedly or you know through disease or something like that so there's all these different stories and you're never going to know how you'll deal with it until it happens to you and then you never really know no one knows how to deal with grief and it'll be different from every single person that you live like losing your life that grieving will be different because it'll be yeah. a different phase of your life a different person a different connection and so to listen to other people's stories about what their grieving was like or what the experience was like losing someone mm -hmm. you, know, you never know who's is going to relate and how how that can make you even just feel heard feel you know um 
not feel alone and also just maybe find resources in which way like how they dealt with it or how they saw something or what they did afterwards to help so mm. it's a really mm. cool aspect that people do that and people talk about those processes yeah. so I find it's really it's also really hard I think there's something that's very um, innately like if you're talking about the grief that you went through or the story that's happened to you like even in having this conversation with you now I feel this sense of vulnerability where I know after this conversation I'm going to be like oh like you know I just you know told the internet or you and all this all these like I guess hard and horrible things that I that I went through and um, that you know that mum went through and there's a there's a sense of vulnerability there so I think a lot of people shy away from even discussing these things but every mm. time I get to talk about mum or every moment that I go through that those couple of weeks that were the hardest weeks of my life and the trauma that I had there I feel as though it releases a little bit of that out of me you know or it, may, it reminds me that I went through something and that it's okay to to discuss it and that it's okay to to remember it as well and that it's even better, you know, to remember the person that you loved in the light that they were, you know, to talk about mum singing, to talk about her spirituality, to talk about the person that she was. Um, you know, sometimes I talk about how absolutely batshit she was at different times because she, she definitely was. So, you know, there's there's all those different there's all those different conversations where it's the light and the dark of loving someone and grieving. Because if we're if we're grieving, it means that we've loved, right? And yeah. I think that um it's scary to have those conversations to talk mm. about things that make you vulnerable. So um, yeah, yeah. yeah, thank you for holding the space for people in that, you know. Yeah. Oh, and thank you for being here because that this will touch so many other people with their story of their parents or what they're going through as well mm. themselves. And hearing you being vulnerable about what you've been through is really important for them to hear to know that they're not alone either so yeah thank you so much for sharing sally and i think that's a great time to finish our conversation so thank you for being here and it's been beautiful it's been beautiful speaking to you again thanks so much kate i really really appreciate it and i appreciate you um giving me the space <laughs>